Okay, brilliant. So this is Navi San Francisco Exploring Career Paths panel discussion. Um, this presentation is a virtual space and it's designed to be a community space. Our volunteers um, will share about their personal journey with navigating counseling careers, volunteering, and graduate school. Before the event, we made a call out to our audience, you all, to submit questions to our panelists. Uh, we got a lot of questions, which was amazing. I did my best to consolidate some um, so that it was a manageable number. Fortunately, I couldn't include every single one of them, uh, but know that at the end, there'll be about 15 minutes for live questions. So if you don't hear um, a question that you want an answer to then, uh, please don't hesitate to drop it in the chat and we can come back to it um, during the end. And actually, Hadley or Kristen or Frank, could you let people in from the break room <laughs> while I do this quick intro? Um, I want to quickly give everyone an or organizational overview about what NAMI San Francisco does outside of this presentation, in case you're not familiar. So we're a peer-led grassroots organization dedicated to serving individuals who live with mental health conditions and their loved ones. Um, we're peer-led, which means that all of our programs are delivered by staff and or trained volunteers who are living with mental health conditions themselves or who support a loved one with a mental health condition. All of our programs are free and open to the public. They include educational classes, support groups, public presentation, and our helpline. If you're interested in learning more about our programs or signing up, please visit our website or send me an email and I'll get back to you. And I'll put those links in the chat a little bit. Um, right now though, I'd like to move on to introductions. So my name is Simone Baghetto. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the peer services director at NAMI San Francisco. So in this role, I do a bunch of things, but most importantly, I manage our peer support groups and our classes for people living with mental health conditions. Everything I made do is made possible by our wonderful volunteers. Four of them are here tonight, um, and I'm excited to introduce them. So firstly, I will introduce Kristen. Um, she is getting a master's in social work from Colorado State University. She joined us in 2020, although like not positive of the year at this point, it's been so long ago. Um, she was one of our founding members of our peer support groups. Um, and she, outside of mental health and graduate school interests, um, she is a major craft beer and craft coffee connoisseur. And she has, so she's attending college in Fort Collins, Colorado. And there are a total of 31 breweries there. She's attended all of them and keeps a spreadsheet ranking all of the breweries, um, her favorites. And then she's also attended 19 cafes and those are on the spreadsheet too. Um, she's often asked for the spreadsheet um, by friends. I've just let her know that I'd like it to be publicly available. So like fingers crossed that that becomes a reality. <laughs> um, next, I wanted to introduce Frank. Um, so in his spare time, Frank likes to read, uh, sorry, <laughs> let me start with the, the, the hard facts, which is uh, Frank is getting uh, marriage and counseling degree, marriage and family therapy master's degree at University of San Francisco. And in his spare time, he likes to read fantasy books and play fantasy video games. He especially likes the Witcher series of books because they have exceptional character development. Um, and you sort of learning about those characters so much, you get into the internal worlds and lives of them, which is actually kind of related to being a counselor, I think. Um, and his favorite character likes to throw, throw fire and do mind control. I didn't know that was a thing. And so now I'm interested in the Witcher series. Next, we've got Hadley. Um, she goes to UPenn and she has gained a GSE um, at UPenn. A grounding practice she's picked up during graduate school has been cooking a variety of vegan and gluten-free cakes to accommodate some of her food allergies. So far, her favorite has been a vanilla lavender cake that she made for a friend. And before her program, she had never lived outside of California. Um, so just to say, like, that takes courage. California native and cake baking and graduate school, obviously. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Kayla. Um, she is at San Francisco State University, and she's going into clinical psychology program. Um, in addition to that, she works as a personal trainer, and she's particularly interested in the intersection of mental health and physical health, right? Those things, you know, support each other or don't support each other, I suppose. We will learn more. Um, and one of her hobbies is grooming her cocker spaniel named Milo. It's surprisingly therapeutic or mindful, I think she said. So a huge welcome to our four panelists. 
thank you so much for coming here tonight. Thanks so much for sharing quirky information about yourself, as well as just your wealth of knowledge on this really important decision and path that you're taking. Um, all right, so now I'd like for you all to do some quick introductions yourself. Um, as good as I am at that, thanks for the compliment in the chat. Um, I'm not gonna do it justice. So if you wouldn't mind each quickly sharing, oops, oh no, where did I put my notes on this? Um, your program, um, or sorry, where you are in your journey. So what the program is again, um, and what specific work you're doing right now, um, what you were doing before you decided to attend graduate school, school or, or career or interest wise, um, and then what's your mental health diagnosis if you feel up to that, and then what area of counseling or social work you're hoping to pursue in the future, um, who you'd like to serve, um, what diagnoses specifically, or what experiences you're most interested in. Um, and to start us off, I will call on Kristen, and then you can popcorn from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Kristen, she, her, um, and I was in San Francisco for five, almost six years um, before I moved to Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I am a year and a half into my master's in social work program. So I will graduate in May and I am so ready to be done, <laughs> but it's been a journey. Um, so specifically, um, I, what, I mean, I'll talk about this more, but one of the great things I've found about social work is that I, I've gotten to dabble in lots of different areas. Um, currently I have a field placement at, um, an addictions treatment center. I'm on the inpatient side. So it's really traditional rehab. Um, it's a 28 day program where I'm doing counseling and groups, um, and combining mental health and substance use, um, as, as part of the co-occurring disorders. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, before all of this, I was in San Francisco, I was working for a human rights organization. Um, my background was in international relations and human rights. So I did not have a background in human services or of any kind. So this was a big career shift for me, um, except that I got to start out this journey with NAMI, which was wonderful. So I joined um, in 2020, um, kind of at height of pandemic times when I was realizing that my own mental health was hard, was, I was having a hard time with my own mental health, um, uh, with my depression and anxiety um, and some other like, you know, interesting diagnostic symptoms there that I've learned in school can be even more problematic than I thought they were. <laughs> um, so I take on my own labels um, and don't all, always share them, but um, it's a place that I've been able to hear for sure, which is great. Um, so yeah, I hope to continue um, in sort of this field. I'm really enjoying the co-occurring, the um, co-occurring disorder, meaning substance use um, and mental health, enjoying working with adults. And actually I've enjoyed really working with people who have never had any sort of mental health care before. So lots mm -hmm. of the concepts are brand new. Thanks so much for sharing, Kristen. So cool to have you here. Um, next, I'd like to call on Hadley. Hello, my name is Hadley. My pronouns are she, her. Um, where am I in my journey? Um, I'm in the same timeline as Kristen. I graduate in May. Um, I am at, so I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, the Graduate School of Education, and it's a two-year, two-master's program until this year. <laughs> so some of the information I'm going to share is not necessarily applicable to the program anymore, but I got my first master's in um, science and education in mental health counseling, uh, last summer and then now I'm finishing up my master's of philosophy and education and professional counseling um, and then after that I will be pursuing my LPC which, which is a licensed professional counselor which is um, similar to LCSW and LMFT which are like other mental health counseling terms 
but it's really state specific. So I am in Pennsylvania and I am pursuing my LPC. Um, what was I, oh, what am I doing now? I currently work in a, a large group private practice in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, I mostly work with adults, but I also have a few um, kids and adolescents, adolescents on my um, caseload. And I see a lot of trauma cases, um, a lot of depression, suicidality, um, but I didn't specifically go to this practice for that. That's just happened upon me. Um, and what was I doing? I, so I was paralegal in, uh, for a bankruptcy law firm while I started volunteering for NAMI. Um, like Kristen, I started in 2020 and got to kind of be a part of this support group process. And it was, um, really important for my personal development as well as, um, having connection in the, yeah, the year of 2020 and beyond. Um, and then mental health diagnosis, anxiety and depression. And then I also have um, a history of concussions. So I manage ADHD um, following post-concussive syndrome, which definitely affects graduate school. Um, what areas of counseling am I hoping to pursue? So I am pursuing um, sex therapy. That's gonna be my like most specific niche work. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do with it yet. I eventually want to work um, with offenders as well as survivors. And um, I'm hoping to work in multiple different settings, but definitely you want to do a lot of trauma work. Um, and I also like working with kids. So I'm also pursuing play therapy and sanitary therapy and all these other things, but um, all of it's really expensive. So I'm going to take my time with it, but I'm starting with sex therapy. That's me. Thank you so much for that information, Hadley. Uh, Frank, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Frank Bacala. Um, as Simone mentioned, I am getting my master's in counseling psychology and then in parentheses, marriage and family therapy, because that's the license I'm going for to be a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. Um, I'm at University of San Francisco for the degree. Um, right now, I'm not working full time. I work a little bit at the general hospital doing like social needs assessment um, for patients, uh, children, patients and their families. I do like a couple of other volunteering things on the side um, and am a parent to my dog uh, and a husband to my wife, basically. So aside from that, before I kind of changed my direction to a career in mental health counseling. I um, worked in business. So I was in, San, I've been in San Francisco since 2016 when I graduated from college. I worked in like strategy consulting and uh, software marketing for like six years total. Um, mm -hmm. And so kind of how I transitioned to this career field was essentially during COVID, like everybody, I feel like I was reflecting on like, why am I here? What am I doing? What does that all mean? Like what, what changes can I make? Cause this is just like, so difficult to go through. And I think through all of that reflecting, I realized I didn't want to wake up in five to eight years with my boss's boss's job, because I knew I would be disappointed in myself. Um, not that it's an easy decision. There were other privileges that I had that allowed me to make that decision to change careers. But, um, that was essentially what prompted my switch into this field. And I also had personal experience with my own uh, mental health challenges, um, identified as having ADHD and anxiety. And then uh, my family has had a lot of issues with it. So I had like a personal stake in maybe helping others share in the benefit that I felt I had gotten from many years of psychotherapy. Um, and also I'd always be interested in psychology kind of academically as well. So it kind of made sense of, you know, how do I do something I'm more proud of? How do I help people? And how do I combine that with things I'm already interested in or know about? So it felt pretty natural. Um, and then, oh, I should mention, I'm in a three-year program, which is quite odd in most states, even in California too, like most programs are two years, um, but mine is essentially three. So it's two years of class. And then the last year is basically your first nine months of tra clinical training. 
So I will, I'm still in class now, and then I'll start actually doing therapy under supervision in fall of this year. Um, and particularly in my program, it's very community mental health oriented. So most of the traineeship is what kind of, that's what they call like the part of doing therapy under supervision while you're still in grad school, they call it a traineeship. Most of those placements are all in community mental health agencies. So mm. they're all stuff where they're, you're working with people who usually don't have insurance. They're certainly not paying out of pocket. So they're often like very high need. They don't have access to a lot of resources and it's a pretty like diverse set um, of people. So I'm not sure exactly where I'll end up particular interest in working with adolescents um, and working with young adults uh, on a number of different issues. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, and thanks, Frank, specifically um, for that last introduction. And I think it's so cool to hear about your different interests. It really shows how many, and I mean, this is only folks going to graduate school for counseling paths, but there are so many different ways to approach this work. So many cool areas of interest that you all bring to this. Um, so thanks for sharing that. So the first one I wanted to start with uh, would be to just define. Uh, did you want me to check in as well? Oh, shoot, Kayla, I'm so sorry, please. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kayla. My pronouns are she, her. Um, where am I in my journey? Um, I am like Hadley and Kristen, also in my last year of my master's program. So I also graduate in May. I'm in a two-year program at SF State in their clinical psych master's program. Um, what specific work? So I am doing my practicum. It's like basically an internship all year at uh, California Pacific Medical Center. So I work at a hospital in an inpatient setting. So that means I work on two different units at the hospital. I work on an acute rehab unit and then a skilled nursing um, unit. And I work primarily with older adults, um, but we see any anyone from 20 to up. Um, so I see a variety of individuals, couples um, and families as well. And so I work primarily with folks that are facing some sort of serious or um, complex medical condition. Um, so I work with a lot with grief. I work a lot with chronic pain. Um, yeah, those are some of the, the topics that come up a lot for me. Um, what was I doing before graduate school? So I used to be a management consultant. Um, I was doing that while, while I volunteered with NAMI um, as a support group facilitator. Um, and I primarily consulted for healthcare companies. So it was very deep in the business world. Um, quickly realized it was, I was basically on the path to become a management consultant since I was a freshman in college. Like I thought that was what I always wanted to do. Um, and I think part of it was just like, I had this like illusion in my head of what it was going to be. And I think I really wanted myself to want it. And it came to a point where it's like, this isn't the lifestyle for me where I was traveling every week and I was feeling burnt out and, my mental health was taking like a tank and I just realized during the pandemic, I needed to make a switch and, and kind of figure out what I wanted to do in my life. And so I started volunteering a lot in my community. So I started volunteering with NAMI, but also with Mindful Arts, which is a organization that works with SFUSD, um, the school district. And I started teaching mindfulness classes to uh, fourth graders at an elementary school near me. And I really enjoyed that kind of work. Um, yeah. And so I just found that like through volunteering and through my interests um, that I was really meant to be in psychology. And so I made the switch and um, yeah, it was definitely a scary switch for me, but I'm very glad that I'm here and that I um, made it here. And then I, um, Aries counseling. I think that I want to work with couples in the future. I'm writing my 
uh, thesis on the use of emotionally focused therapy with couples facing some sort of serious or complex medical condition. Um, I'd be really interested in pursuing couples work or doing uh, fertility counseling. I think that would be also really interesting. Um, really love the work that I do at the hospital. So would also be happy to continue working in a hospital setting or doing some sort of inpatient work. Yeah. Kayla, no, that was a really great introduction. Thank you, all of you. Kayla, I'm so sorry I almost missed you. That would have been terrible. Uh, so those are really robust intros, and I feel like you've already gotten to some really meaty topics and things that we are going to address in this conversation. So thanks for those thorough interactions. The place I want to start is maybe with like one just pros and cons of LPCs, um, LMFT, and LCSW programs. Um, and I was going to start with Kristen, um, if you'd like to give that a stab, and then we've got Frank to fill in any gaps. Yeah, this was one of the hardest decisions for me. Um, and I think for a lot of people, figuring out what the heck is the difference. Um, so an LPC stands for Licensed Professional Counselor, LMFT, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist, and LCSW is a licensed clinical social worker. Um, ultimately, licensure doesn't come with your graduate degree. So pursuing a licensure is always gonna be after a degree. Some programs, like it sounds like kind of build it in. Mine certainly does not. <laughs> so I'll be pursuing clinical licensure after this, which is um, an additional two years, not of school, but of, um, supervised practice. So I, I'll be hired, I'll be working full time, um, but doing those exams and things will come later. So ultimately, I think the question too is just the difference between a counseling program and social work program or others. So one thing that I found, because I definitely had a misconception in my head about social work, um, I, I knew social work primarily as working in like child protective services or adoption. I think that's what comes to mind for a lot of people. And social work is maybe one of the biggest buckets where any of these things can fall into. So if I pursue a clinical license, um, I can provide one-on-one -on -one individual therapy the same way that a licensed professional counselor does. However, in my two years, I only get three classes that are dedicated to clinical skills. So it's a common issue, I would say, for people who have wanted to be like, no, this is, I know I want to be an individual counselor or in private practice. Um, I know I have people in my cohort now who are feeling woefully unprepared, um, which luckily we have uh, built-in field placements or internships, um, which is where we get a majority of that experience. It's not so much in the classroom because with social work, I'm also taking numerous classes on policy and learning about history. I'm learning about families and groups in one of these classes, um, but there's also one all about anti-oppressive social work and what does that look like? So for me, I chose social work because I felt that it was so broad and I wanted to dabble in everything. It's, it's considered the the micro individual, the mezzo, the community, and the macro, meaning kind of that big picture. And I love mm -hmm. that big picture work too. Um, so that's been my experience and why I ultimately chose. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Frank, would you like to sort of fill folks in on your decision? Sure, yeah, and thanks Kristen for that explanation. I feel like you made my second answer a lot easier if I can kind of build off what you said. Um, at least speaking from the California lens, and I say that because unfortunately and deeply confusingly, like all of these different licenses are slightly different and have slightly different requirements and number of units and number of years and settings, et cetera, state by state. But they're, I would say they're all like, they have some similarities, but there's, since they are state by state, I can only like really speak to how it is in California, but you can assume that 
I would say like 70% of the main things are going to be similar. Like you usually go get a master's degree for two years to be one of these licenses. Um, and they, I think generally they call them like, if you wanted to wrap it all up uh, as like master's level therapists. So someone who does psychotherapy with a master's degree of some kind. Um, and so for me, at least in California, I was, my whole thing was I wanted to do psychotherapy with people. Um, I didn't have an interest in the other social, more broad kind of like social work elements of managing case management and sort of resource navigation, understanding of like the policy environment. So in practice, my at least my understanding of social work when I was applying, and Chris would know a lot better, but um, was that you, in addition to doing therapy, you also have training in or could have training in doing um, connecting clients with resources that are outside of the family room or outside of the therapy room in order to kind of like benefit their well-being or general welfare. So I didn't have an interest in that sort of like logistical exercise. I had more an interest in just doing the therapy. So for me, I kind of ruled out the social work path um, and was just looking at the LMFT and LP in California, it's actually called LPCC, Licensed Professional Clinical Counselor. And then there's Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. Um, and to make it even more confusing, my understanding is in every other state in the US, it's more common to be a licensed professional counselor than it is a licensed marriage and family therapist, except in California, it's more common to be a licensed marriage and family therapist than it is to be a licensed professional counselor. And I'm already confusing myself just talking about it because it, it makes no sense. But um, my understanding was essentially to go for the one that was most commonly used. Um, and at least in California, licensed parent urgent family therapists, they do everything. I think their, their scope of practice is very similar with licensed professional clinical counselors mm -hmm. in the sense that we both would see families and individuals and potentially children or couples, depending on what it is that you specialize in, but you're legally able to do all of those things with either license. It's just that that LMFT, at least in California, and I think in may probably in other states, hopefully, they mm -hmm. make you do some amount of training with either like families, couples, or children, whereas in the counselor track, I don't know if it's always legally required, but anyway, that's how it was in California. So essentially, California, I was like, okay, how do I do therapy? I get a master's degree, and what are the licenses for that? There's two of them. What's the one that's most common? It's the LMFT. But I may, mm -hmm. just to like round off my answer, I actually will probably check all the boxes to be eligible to sit for both tests for the LPCC and the LNFT, just in case things change, like as, I don't know if there, there becomes like a self-marketing benefit to having both at some point, or if for some reason one gets granted some special abilities or in counseling later down the line that I'm not aware of now, I may just go ahead and sit for both of them, but that will be more of like a judgment call once I get you know, three years out from now, once I would actually be ready to take those tests. Um, so hopefully that answer was somewhat helpful uh, and not too confusing, but that's kind of how I decided. Thanks so much for that. They were very helpful. I definitely am glad I'm recording this because I feel like I'll need to re-listen to that. <laughs> um, you all are so candid about that being confusing. Um, and it is, and it's a huge barrier to entry. So that's why I'm really glad that we're doing this. So now I want to hear next from I have um, something oh, yeah. really quickly to add to that just for the LPC bubble. Yeah. Um, something that I didn't really know going in to the program is that because I, uh, you know, went out of state, so went from California to Pennsylvania, like I, I didn't sign up to get licensed in Pennsylvania, but my program is positioned to license me as an LPC in Pennsylvania. And that's often going to be the case. And so one of the first things they say to you is where do you want to be licensed? Which is kind of an unreasonable question to ask someone who won't pursue their license for four years. Um, Cause you do like 3000 hours after you graduate from your two year program usually. Um, and if I had wanted to get licensed in California which I originally did, I would have had to come and take a California law and ethics exam on top of the national counselor examination. 
um, and then take multiple California specific courses. Hmm. So when you're looking at programs, it's actually important to think about where you would want to be licensed because your program might be positioning you to be licensed in a certain place and that'll affect you down the line. Um, there is something called reciprocity once you get your license. So for example, I'll have my license in Pennsylvania in like two and a half years. I could apply to transfer my license to another state, but there are certain requirements. For example, like if I wanna to go to New York from Pennsylvania, I have to be working as a licensed professional counselor for two to three years before going to New York. It's like three years before going to California, I still have to take the law and ethics exam. So these things are like super convoluted, super confusing, but these are the kind of questions that are important to ask, you know, admissions people, faculty, uh, programs you're interested in, and really getting an understanding of how supportive they are of you in the process of pursuing licensure and getting some of these questions answered. So yeah, that's all. Thanks for that, Adam. That is really important. And I can imagine could really bum someone out if they were in a place that they wanted to live, went to school somewhere else, couldn't practice in that place. Wow. That is confounding. Um, all right. So actually, Hadley, I'll stick with you for a second. So similar, but a little different. I was wondering, how did you decide to attend UPenn and your specific program? Yeah, um, so I knew I wanted to go to the East Coast. So I actually, um, I was going to apply to USF. Um, that was my one California school. Um, and I would have gone for my LMFT if I had done that. Um, but realized I just really wanted to do something and get away. And this was my opportunity to do it in a supported um, environment, like a university. Um, I was having a really hard time choosing <laughs> between these programs because it's really confusing even what, knowing what is going to prepare you to be a therapist in the ways that we understand what it is to be a therapist. Um, I ended up just deciding between Boston University, their School of Medicine program and um, UPenn. And I was pretty set on Boston. And then I took a deeper dive into um, into who their faculty was. And they were all genius, amazing people, but they also were quite homogeneous and looked a lot like the people that I am already around all the time, AKA like white upper middle-class people um, of a lot of privilege. And doesn't mean they couldn't teach me a lot, but it wasn't necessarily what I was looking for from an education in mental health. Um, and when I took a look at Penn's program, I realized there was a much larger focus on um, like not only diversity, but also actually imparting on their students um, this kind of like zest for advocacy in mental health work, because it is part of our job. Even if we're just one on one with clients, like we are constantly advocating for our clients. Um, so that was really important to me and it ended up being definitely the right decision. Um, Philadelphia also just as a city was something I was taking into consideration um, when I was looking at programs and it was just, I think the perfect place for me to be extending my education and challenging myself um, while still being in, you know, a city surrounded by a bunch of people and young people and everything that I wanted in a city. But yeah, that was pretty much what made the decision for me. Thanks for sharing. And it's like a point that I want to dive into deeper. And another one of our questions, which is like, what are some of the shortcomings of graduate schools, especially as it comes to diversity and inclusion um, and mm -hmm. socioeconomic representation? Um, yes. But before we go there, um, Kayla, did you want to share a little bit more about how you chose your program um, in school? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, my roots are in San Francisco, and so I knew I wanted to stay in the Bay Area. Just all my family's here. Um, my fiance's here, and it just didn't make a lot of sense for me to look for schools outside of the Bay Area. Um, 
And I actually was planning on going to a PsyD program. So I was planning to get my doctorate and I had applied to a school. I got an N and I only applied to one master's program. And I was like, there's no way I'm getting in. There's like only eight people that get in. There's, it's not going to be me. And so when I got in, I was like, shoot, I got it. Now what? Uh, um, and so I was really like, I really had a hard time choosing between doctorate and master's, which is a whole different conversation and I won't get into it unless folks are interested. Um, but I ultimately chose to go the master's route for a lot of reasons. And this particular program was, there's a reason why I only applied to this program and I really loved it because it is super small. So there's only eight of us in our cohort. It's very intimate. Um, I could tell like the professors and the cohorts were all very close. And that's something I wanted was I didn't just want colleagues. I wanted like lifelong friends. And I felt like I could find that in this program. And I feel like so far it, it's been the case, like where I find that um, my cohort mates are really good friends as well. Um, there's also the opportunity to do research with professors. Um, I was really interested in at least trying to do research and joining a lab. And I uh, was able to do that in my program. And I'm in one of my professor's labs studying mm -hmm. um, relationships and emotions. Um, and I'm enjoying it. So that was also another draw. Um, and I just really loved that I got to start clinical work right away. So something that's rare about my program, or at least I think it's rare, is that I started my clinical work. So I actually started doing therapy year one, probably like a month or two in. And then in addition to seeing like several clients in our psychology clinic as a therapist in this new role, I was also working at um, Edgewood, which is an adolescent residential center and then getting kind of experience running groups with adolescents. Um, who are facing some sort of moderate to severe mental health challenge. Um, and so I knew I would get really good clinical training starting year one. And that's what I wanted. Um, and then lastly, I was like really impressed by the interview process of my program. Um, it was quite an intense interview, but it, it included both the graduate students and professors. So like the graduate students were also part of the interview and interviewing. And they also like had us, like they would get together with the professors at the end of the day and talk about candidates. And I like loved that the professors were actually listening to like the cohort. Um, and that was important to me that like we would have our, our voices heard um, and, and that they would be receptive to what we wanted and needed as a program. And I felt like I would get that at us of state. Um, mm. Yeah. And from a practical standpoint, I like really recommend looking at um, state universities just because of tuition. Mm. Um, I would, my tuition is between nine and 10 K a year, which is very low in comparison to a lot of master's programs which, you know, is such a reality. Like there's so many barriers to going to graduate school and finances is one of them for a lot of us. And just like that should not prohibit anyone from pursuing higher education. And so I highly recommend finding programs that like feel okay for you financially. And again, this is like there's a lot of like privileges associated to being able to get into a smaller program. But again, I just want to let everyone know that it's out there that you could find programs that are a little bit less expensive. Thanks so much for that answer, Kayla. And I think that is so important to think about is just like the finances of this, because that can be such a huge stressor and it's not something that gets talked about candidly frequently. So thank you um, for covering that in your answer. All right, so the next one, and I think this is sort of touching on, yeah, something that we're skirting around, but I want to get directly to, which is what are some of the issues around privilege, um, access, socioeconomic, race, like lack of diversity and inclusion in 
um, graduate school. And then also people ask around volunteer work because this is a panel of volunteers at NAMI San Francisco. This isn't a group of people that um, weren't volunteering. This is actually one that I will touch on, um, the volunteer piece and the nonprofit piece, because I think that's part of this conversation. Um, and then Kristen, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about sort of graduate school. Um, and so one of the things, yeah, so first I'll just say volunteer work is not accessible for everyone. Um, it requires you to give time and energy that is unpaid to an organization. I think also in nonprofits, it's similar to any sort of professional situation where language is used that not everybody sort of speaks fluently. Like I actually think that there's like professionalism is like something that um, is an expectations in so many different workplaces. Um, and that's just sort of assumed to be a thing. So it's something that I listen for more is like, how are we bringing in literally more diverse voices? Um, I think it's also within a system that is inherently racist and classist. Uh, you know, the idea of nonprofits and NAMI San Francisco specifically, or NAMI national entirely is that um, it was started by people that were able to afford to donate their time to make these programs happen. I mean, so that's just going to be sort of built into every level. Um, and I think that mental health, the field, um, the understanding, the diagnosis, all of that is sort of, again, within a system of racism and classism. So uh, the more and more I sort of learn about different cultural needs, the more I realize that, you know, so many of the labels that we're using, so many of the systems that we're using are just inherently not addressing everybody's needs. So um, huge issues there. I also think graduate school, as Kayla was saying, it's expensive um, and it's not easy for everybody to access. Um, and then the final point I'll make is just systems navigation is difficult. So like knowing about, knowing people that worked in a nonprofit in itself, it's easier if you have like a relation that is volunteering someone somewhere, um, like being able to access like technology, again, that's like sort of sharing this information um, that can be prohibitive. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm doing this panel is because I do want more systems navigation information out to the public. Um, and I know all of our panelists feel the same way. It's just like, this can be sort of a thing that's like happening behind closed doors. Like how does academia work? I would love for that not to be the case. I would love for everybody to have equal access to that information um, and have it accessible in video form um, and you know every form that anyone could possibly want to reach. This is just a small drop in that bucket. Um, but that's sort of like a wrap on what I'll say. I guess final thing is just what we're trying to do to address some of this is offer more paid positions. Of course, that's difficult because it requires funding. So we'll be soliciting more donations, um, but sort of finding finding more opportunities to pay people to deliver these programs is huge for us. Um, but we always need to keep the programs free. So that's sort of the delicate balance I'm working within. Um, and yeah, I'll pass to Kristen. If you want to fill on fill in more on graduate school. Yeah. I also, you know, a huge concern for me was not wanting to be in huge amounts of debt, of course, and that was a deep concern. Um, I think something I am really glad that I ended up hearing from someone was that for a lot of these programs, not all of them, but for example, for a master's in social work, um, while the state of Colorado is, you know, maybe different among different states, Ultimately, all of the programs have a lot in common because they have to. They are governed what they can teach by the National Association of Social Workers or NASW. And so when I was looking specifically at like a private school versus a public school, that truly the private school was three times more expensive. And someone said, you're going to get a very similar education, ultimately. Um, and I was so grateful to hear that because that weighed a lot into my decision um, just based on what national standards were required. Um, I think once I arrived, I also was hoping that um, that would provide a lot more opportunity for um, diverse voices. And while I do have like some, our, our cohort is our cohort started as 15 people and then we actually got combined. Um, and there's no doubt that even in a program that talks about oppression and social justice every single day, sometimes the mirror is not there 
And there's a lot of moments of like, we're talking about this in theory as if these people who have been harmed are not sitting in this room. That's such a problem in a master's program, I think, across the board. Um, so that's interesting. If people are able to feel safe enough to speak up or even in small groups, there's a lot of advocacy that happens in those spaces. Um, but the financial piece of it is huge. I, I wanted to mention, like, I was certainly told um, that lots of people work throughout their master's program. Um, and I was fully prepared to do that. Um, luckily, I was at a job that would continue to give me insurance benefits at uh, only working 20 hours a week. But so I'm responsible for my me and my husband's insurance. Um, and I can't drop below 20 hours. And that is really, really hard. Um, people talk about how hard grad school is. And for me, while the academic work is hard, it is the time, the privilege of time to be able to have, I have to have those 20 hours. I currently have nine hours of in-person class. And then I'm expected to do between 22 and 25 hours of internship. And I am one of three people of 30 who have a paid internship. So <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> They are constantly working to get more paid internships. They are constantly saying, you know, we can try. Um, scholarships were very, very limited in my experience um, as far as for graduate school. I thought it was gonna be more like undergrad. Um, depends on the school, of course. Um, but that financial piece has been difficult and I am um, working way more just time uh, than I anticipated. So that's a huge part of that and recognizing yeah. that I have a lot of privilege to be able to still manage all of those things. Thanks for that answer, Kristen. That's a huge, huge point. Um, and I think it's something too, thinking about, you know, people living with mental health conditions trying to get into this work and like the barriers to access there. Um, it's when I hear the workload, like, and I've heard from each of you individually how much work this is and it, it, it's hard to conceptualize. So thanks for that answer. Um, all right, so next, initially I was gonna ask everyone to answer this question, but I'm realizing that we're getting a little short on time. So um, I'll just ask from Frank and Kayla, what did what role did volunteering play in your decision to attend um, the program that you're attending or to like pursue graduate schools? And what, uh, what other factors ended up leading to your decision? And you know, I think this could be like a shorter answer because we've talked about it a little bit, but go for it. Um, and we can start with Frank and then Kayla. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll be kind of brief. So volunteering actually um, didn't play much of a role because I made the decision when I was still at my old job um, and I was working a lot and I wasn't actively volunteering at that time and started volunteering more once I got into grad school to get more experience in kind of a related field. Um, for me, the the motivation was was more around like I had a desire to do something that felt meaningful. So I wanted to help people and not uh, my, my shareholder overlords that I was benefiting at the time. And uh, additionally, I had gotten a lot of benefit from my own therapy and seen a lot of people around me have the same. And so I was hoping that maybe I could try to pass, pay that forward because I have access to care uh, that I'm grateful for. And I wanted to try to maybe play a part in providing access to care for others. Um, so that was kind of what led, uh, led me to the decision. Thanks for sharing, um, how I got involved in the work too, largely. So thanks. Um, and Kayla, did you want to answer that? Yeah. Similar to Frank, I think I figured it out, um, when I was in my last job, but I think NAMI, volunteering at NAMI really solidified that this is what I wanted to do. Um, I started doing a lot of work that didn't involve actually working on projects. I like was really feeling burnt out in my last job. And so I started on taking on all these like internal side projects, which basically involved me like leading weekly support groups for new joiners like across the country. And I was like, this is the work that I want to do. Like this is 
what feels meaningful, not sitting in on meetings, listening to how I can help a company make more money. It just, yeah, I think I was like, I really need to find something that feels fulfilling and meaningful because it's going to be a job that I do for the rest of my life. And so I was going to spend a lot of time doing it. And I just, I also really relate to you, Frank, when you said like, I, I just couldn't see myself wanting to be promoted. I was like, almost like, please don't promote me. I don't want to be a senior associate. I don't want to be a manager. I don't see myself kind of going up the career ladder um, in the role that I was in. And so I think it became very clear that I wanted to pursue something different. And then when I came to NAMI and started volunteering, I was like, wow, this work feels like really important. And I don't think I've felt that in a long time. And it was like a feeling that I craved. It's just like, I feel like the work that I do matters. Um, and I think that's what it came down to. Um, so that's why I'm here. Thanks for those answers. And I'd just like to reiterate, all of these folks have given a good amount of time to our organization. And so, yeah, that those aren't empty words. They are dedicated to delivering free programs and, you know, improving access to better mental health care support. Um, all right, I guess next one sort of, yeah, we circled around this, I keep saying that, but want to talk more about how folks manage mental health symptoms. I think health symptoms symptoms more broadly and stress of graduate school as well as the workload. Um, and Hadley, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, um, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's definitely hard. Um, something they really like preached to us our first year was self-care, 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 um, which we all would kind of laugh at because how could we do self-care with the amount of work we had? Um, and same as Kayla's program, we started practicum day one. So I was in a public K through eight um, before I had even learned a single counseling skill. Um, so you you are really thrown in, but that's how you learn quickly. It's also how you learn quickly how to take care of yourself. Um, and I will say it's been really important for me to lean on the people around me. And I don't just mean, you know, my loved ones, like my support system, I mean, my peers and my professors, faculty, supervisors. Um, I think before this program, I felt uncomfortable leaning on people that were built in to help me. Like in undergrad, I wouldn't lean on advisors or whoever it was. Um, you kind of can't get away with that anymore because you are learning so much from your supervisors in your practicums and internships and um, they are meant to kind of guide you through. And that's been really important for me, not just pro professionally, but also personally to learn how they manage. Um, and something that I try to remember when I'm not doing my best at prioritizing my own mental health is that like my self-care is not just for me anymore it's also for my clients um because weeks that i did not care for my mental health or my health um as well as i should have are the weeks that i struggle the most in supporting my clients and um i would never want that to affect their experience so yeah it's hard but it's it's manageable and it's very much so includes growing pains um and it's something that i am still learning for sure Beautifully said. Thanks, Hadley. Kristen? Yeah, I don't know if you all have this experience, but so going in, I was I was very nervous. I had self-disclosed in my essays. It's definitely part of what got me into my program, no doubt, in talking about my passion and, and how I've, I've come to a point where I can hold and maintain boundaries. Um, and I was nervous I'd be the only one. And like 90% of my program has struggled with mental health <laughs> it was very like everyone there we all were like duh that's why we're here <laughs> and I was like okay and it it's to varying degrees and people have had different experiences um but throughout my time I've disclosed more and more and things that I never thought I would talk about or like present on um 
I ended up giving a presentation because we were, there was a unit on hospitalization for suicidality. And I ended up sharing my story with my class because not everyone had that experience. And my professors thanked me and my fellow students thanked me. And um, there was not a single person who was going to let me leave that classroom alone after that either, knowing that that was hard even years ago. So that community care, in addition to the self-care, has been really important. And my cohort has not gotten along the whole time at all. We've had some really rough points and I still feel supported. Um, I know that there are some programs that even require you to have counseling or therapy throughout. Um, mine doesn't require that, but we have a really um, connected relationship with the um, school crisis center and the school counselors. So um, working through some of those struggles has been really difficult. And then I thought I was good at boundaries. Grad school forced it. <laughs> it really has forced it. Like I need just some really silly fun in my life more than I ever thought. Um, for me, one of those things has been trivia. Like we, one of the breweries that I go to, um, we go to trivia and I go to trivia every week and I must because that's just silly and fun and not around all, some people in my cohort, some people not, um, but we don't talk about the serious mental health stuff for a minute and it is incredibly helpful. So finding something like that that is unrelated is actually really important too. Thank you for that, Kristen. Um, and Frank dropped in the chat, so I'll read this out loud. He said, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but to Kristen's point, most of the people I've met in counseling fields have had their own mental, they had their own challenges with mental health conditions. Um, and I think that's not what I expected. Like, I, I'm surprised to hear this, that it's, Kristen, that sounds more supportive than I would have imagined. And I know a lot of, I mean, most of our volunteers, if not all um, that I work with, are managing their own mental health journeys or supporting family members with that. But I didn't expect that in the counseling world. So that's so cool to hear um, and makes me feel very hopeful. All right, um, more of a sort of like a technical nitty gritty questions. What helps you prepare, or maybe not technical, it could be more broad. Um, what helps you prepare for applications, um, the programs um, and the work after graduate or prepare for applications and programs that you're going to and what's preparing you for work after graduate school and getting a job? Oh, and that, let's start with uh, Kayla. Yeah, um, what prepared me for graduate school? Uh, being in my own therapy. <laughs> I think has like taught me more than anything that I've learned in graduate school actually. Um, so I highly recommend if you have not experienced that and you're interested in going into the field, um, trying therapy out and seeing what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And I think that's also how you kind of find your niche and your interest too, is actually like experiencing it and trying different modalities because it's one thing to like learn the theory and it's another thing to actually experience the kind of shifts that you experience in therapy um, because they can be quite profound. Um, and then I guess on like a practical level, I like was really focused because I did a career shift um, I really wanted to get more clinical experience because I didn't have any. I studied managerial economics and tech management in undergrad. So I definitely did not have a psych background. Um, so I really started kind of doing more work, as much work as I could, kind of working within my community with individuals, couples, families. Um, and I think that also gave me a better understanding of what I was getting myself into, because sometimes it's hard to really know what it's going to be like as a therapist. Um, e even when you're starting graduate school, you're like, what does it even mean for me to be a therapist? I think there's a lot of question marks for me. Um, but I think it definitely helped finding uh, the kind of clinical experiences beforehand to, to really help me understand what it is like to hold someone's pain like that is like a very specific challenging skill um and it's not for everyone and i you know i 
I don't say that to be discouraging at all, but I, I just say that to, to just encourage you all to, to really try it first. Um, and so I think that helped me prepare the most for graduate school. And then now that I'm coming up to graduation, I am really leaning on my professors, really leaning on my supervisor, um, really leaning on my two co two cohorts, one at the hospital and then one at school um, to kind of help me figure out what I want to do. I think I still am figuring it out, um, but it's mm -hmm. been really helpful to have folks that understand like what's out there and what to look for. So, yeah. Thank you, Kayla. Really what well said. It is not easy to accompany people through the heavy stuff and hold space for it. Um, and I love that you said it's not for everyone. That's really fair and honest. Um, all right. So I actually, I don't know, uh, Frank, let me let me hear from you. Um, what did help you pre prepare for applications and then what's preparing you for work after? Yeah, that was, uh, I had a lot in common um, with what Kayla said, she probably just say it a little bit better, articulate a little bit better, but there is a lot of overlap, especially in the application process around, I'd say what prepared me most for that was also doing therapy. I mean, it may have helped that I kind of had been doing my own like psychology, psychotherapy research via listening to like an obscene amounts of podcasts on it during COVID for like a year. And I had probably built some of that into my essay as well, but I mean, I, it was more the self-reflection and sort of feeling you kind of had maybe like a emotional orientation towards therapy, um, particularly at least what I've experienced in my kind of pro the, uh, my MFT program and in kind of my broader cohort is it seems like there's, of course, there's scientific elements, there's technical elements, and there's like nerdy stuff, but it seems like what all of the people I've talked to, regardless of whether they're psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health counselors, LMFTs, they always say that your humanness and your kind of emotional knowledge and experience is like the most powerful tool that you have. So in many ways, it's like not like, it's not studying for a math test to help somebody. It's, it's going through a personal growth and kind of like being able to hold people's pain and challenges, as Kayla said. So it's, it's, it's sort of different than uh, I think a lot of like applying for school processes in that way. It's kind of more about the emotional dimension than the technical one. Um, and then for, as far as for applying for getting a job after I'm still applying for my traineeship, I don't have one yet, but um, I don't know, it may be different in different communities, but I don't think so. My sense is that there's just a ton of need in this field. And if people are motivated to go get a master's degree and sit with people and be a therapist, a lot of people aren't. So I feel like being yourself and trusting what you've learned and getting advice from, you know, teachers and people that you trust is kind of the best way to approach, you know, the step after grad school. Because the nice thing about being in this field is there's a lot of need. So I mm. think in many ways, I've been encouraged to not overthink it so much when it came to the next phase following grad school or following the class part of grad school, at least. That's at least my experience. Um, so I don't know, mileage may vary depending on where you are, but that's kind of what I've been told. Of course, but thanks for that. Really good point. Um, all right, so we've got 10 more minutes in this and I noticed a couple of people have dropping off. So actually I'm gonna quickly drop, if you need to leave early, do copy and paste this link, I'll also send it out for um, a feedback survey. But now I wanna sort of move into our more live questions. Um, and I see, I wanted to come back to something that Denise was asking about, and it's actually a question that I was hoping to ask based on a lot of the form responses, um, which is just about disclosure um, in your graduate school application um, and then in your program. And I think, I mean, Kristen, <laughs> you really let us all know how amazing you were to be able to self-disclose. And so I guess I'm interested, um, Denise was asking, how deep is the stigma around mental health issues in academia? And I think, so I would be curious, like, you know, how did disclosure go for people? Um, and then also, there's a lot of great examples of ways in which this isn't stigmatized. It sounds like most people readily identify with living with a mental health condition or receiving support around that. But I guess what is sort of the like lurking stigma? Um, and I ask that too, because I notice in general, like 
it seems like our nation is much more quick to talk about mental health, um, but sometimes it feels like it falls short. And it, it reminds me of even like the snickering that happened where it was like, yeah, they tell us to practice self-care, but then ha ha ha, as if we could. Um, so does anyone want to take a stab at that sort of like mashup question about disclosure and stigma? Yeah, Hadley. I, I can start. Um, yeah, I will say like I've had a similar experience. I have a bigger cohort. We are about 50 people. Um, and I pretty much just assume <laughs> that everyone has had their own journey with mental illness. Um, like that is just kind of a broad assumption um, that we contain the empathy that we do for our clients somewhere from a personal place, um, whether that's, you know, being alongside someone else in their journey or being on our, our own journeys. Um, I, I don't want to like say it's a requirement to go into this field, but I do think the majority of people get into this because of, um, their own journeys and probably seeing what needs to be done and these gaps in the field that need to be filled. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I think, so it sounds like there's like many elements that are not stigmatizing, but what are maybe oh, stigmas or yes. things that make it less accessible for people living with mental health conditions? Yeah. So I will say that um, I feel like saying you have anxiety and depression is like nobody's going to bat an eye, but I don't think I've ever heard somebody to, or, and maybe like other mood disorders people will talk about openly anything outside of like an anxiety disorder mood disorder I have not heard of any disclosures and I am not assuming that's because they don't exist in my cohort I think that it's maybe harder to talk about I think there are still concerns about how people will see um like how people will perform in an academic setting. I think there still is that stigma as well as, you know, something that came to my mind is we do a whole bunch of mock sessions in class and um, film sessions that you present to the class. And it's usually with either first years or people in our direct cohort. And they basically say, you know, talk about whatever you want, except for here's a list of things you probably shouldn't talk about. And they call it the safe topics list. And it mostly includes, you know, trauma, suicidality, um, like any kind of self-harm, um, any kind of psychosis, anything, pretty much like anything along the lines of that. And that's so much of what we're actually doing, right? Like that is so much of this work. And so that is, I think, a pretty good example of how it shows up literally in our classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's like, purposefully left out of the mock work that we're doing with one another um and I think that the goal with it is to not overwhelm you know the trainee the tra the training counselor um but we're so overwhelmed in our practicums and our internships all the time why not practice it in the classroom why not further destigmatize these things that are probably going on within our cohorts so kind of like other people were saying I think that there are um, advancements within our master's programs in terms of mental health stigmatization, but there's definitely still things that are lacking. Um, and you'll even see it sometimes in the books that are given to you to read. And in certain conversations, I also have to respect that everyone's coming from different environments and have been socialized differently around mental health. So um, it's a lot, but it's also a lot to work with, yeah. I think. And it's usually with a group of people that are motivated to work towards a world that has less mental health stigma. So, yeah. Great answer, Hadley. Um, and if someone wants to quickly chime in, like any big gaps, otherwise I want to try to get through a couple more questions, but I think Hadley did a really good job with that. Looks yeah, like, I'll also oh, yeah. just quickly add that I think part of individually, I don't find as much stigma systematically. That's where you find the stigma. The systems haven't caught mm. up in the same way. And yeah. that's what shines through. Oh, what a good point. That's just like, yeah, like the quote of the night, probably, <laughs> or not the quote of the night, but like 
the quote of my job. Um, it's the systems often, not usually the individuals. Um, all right, so Karen had asked specifically, sorry, and let me actually turn off the recording now. So if anyone wants to use your name, but um, wanted to ask Kayla, uh, how you chose to do your program versus a master's. Yeah, I, I put my answer.